ora, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to The World of Words Goes Digital. He kōrero, mati heko o te ao. World of Words Goes Digital celebrates Aotearoa's authors, comedians, musicians and poets who share words of wisdom, inspiration, personal challenges and journeys, culminating in a series of rich and diverse conversations. Right, welcome to The World of Words Goes Digital by WOMAD. I'm Kevin Chapman and I'm here to talk to Tereda. Uh, hopefully for your enjoyment. This program exists because of the support of Creative New Zealand. Um, to Radar is a New Zealand comedian, television personality, raconteur, history and lifestyle presenter, um, and many other things. Um, so, to Radar, which of those things are you? Oh, all, all of them, all of them, and and none of them, I suppose. Lifestyle presenter. Is well, <laughs> my lifestyle presenter. I guess I am presenting a lifestyle. My lifestyle is is one where you can, you can, you can, you can take something that you love as a creative form, and you can make a career out of it. You know, if uh, someone you also can invent environmentally li- environmental living programs. Environmental living programs, programs about butchery. And actually, the interesting thing about those programs, you know, we looked at them a lot. I talk about them all the time. Say off the radar and things. I so say they're not so much programs about about sustainability their programs about community and so in, in a way all, all of the stuff i do is sort of about community but what am i i raconteur i mean i, I make a living talking uh, maybe a humorist I, I use the power of humor as a gateway into people's consciousness to then tell them something else generally documentary based facts so yeah a non a non-fictional humorist uh, a teller of tales teller of true tales with humor i don't know humor's always been a very powerful thing it's always you know it's it's the gateway it's it's how do you slip something into how do you how do you lure someone in to watch something that you want to have as quite a serious kind of message so so i really wanted mostly to talk about about your um your live shows so how do you get humor into Antarctica. So Antarctica was a show about the, the history of Antarctica. You, you, you have to look for those moments where things become so absurd, or you go, why did they, why did they do that? And sometimes, you know, stories can be humorous by the, the very nature of the kind of the lineal action, or they can be humorous because of the setting, or they can be humorous because of the context of which you put them. And, and humor is an interesting thing. I, you know, um, you, you never want to punch down when you're celebrating people's stories. So you have to tell them in a way that befits the kind of honor of the stories to a certain extent, you know, but if I was just to simply do, you know, a monologue on the history of Antarctic exploration, yeah. it could be very dull when in fact the stories are beyond belief with how bonkers they are. You know, the most bonkers thing is how did no one just die? How, how did anyone survive down there? You know, it's cold cold yes. very cold coldest place in the world Didn't apparently know you know and it can get colder you know uh absolutely cherry garage and you know the one of the great antarctic books the worst journey of the world he's so cold at one point when they're off bloody traipsing after a penguin egg um his teeth shatter he's chatter he's shivering so much that his teeth shatter which makes it difficult because then he can't eat his little rusks that they're given on their their, their trip out and he you know he has this this wonderful sort of quote he says um we're not afraid to die. Men are not afraid of death. They're afraid of, of the pain of, of kind of continuing to live in a way, mm. uh, you know, um, yeah, and that's, that's a, that's a particularly good story. How you find the humor is you, you choose the stories you want to tell and then you structure them in such a way that the humor comes out, I suppose. Um, and, and, you know, to your first question, what am I? I mean, what is that show? It's, it's essentially the shows that I'm doing at the moment, are, 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 comedic documentaries you could watch them on tv i have powerpoints i use lots of images and maps and and illustrations and things and i you know i think antarctica is a 50 minute show with something like 140 clicks on the old powerpoint thing that's that's very fast someone said it was like watching a um a funny ken burns you know so they're they're a documentary that you see on stage but they could be television yeah, in a way. So I like yep. mixing that kind of medium up, and I like I like pe- taking people on this journey where it's it's beyond the con 
you know, people say, oh, God, PowerPoint. Oh, I wrote a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, God, it's a lecture on history. You know, all of these things and making them something fun and entertaining. Yeah, we, we, called, it, uh, we called it PowerPointless. Right. Um, yeah. which, See, is, which, yeah. which is where somebody makes up a slide and then they read to you what's on the slide oh, because you're too dumb like to read it yourself. Like don't like that. No, I do like sometimes it. putting up a slide with writing on it and reading it. Um, you know, uh, particularly uh, there's a, a gentleman who, who wrote the history of or, or the first book on, on the Antarctic penguins. Uh, and I put up a, uh, some of his diary notes because the Adelie penguin in particular, um, is it a sexually depraved little bird? Uh, most people just see a cute penguin. Actually, it is, yeah, it is a degenerate. Uh, and so when this guy discovered this, he's writing the notes in his diary. And because this was sort of 1910, they didn't want theory was they didn't want uneducated people to know what was going on with these birds or gentler people, gentler people the fairer sex or children um who they often considered the fairer sex to be essentially um so he's writing it all down and then suddenly when he gets to sort of graphic parts it's all written in greek it's beautiful you know and so it's it's finding little things like that and and part of the the joy and the challenge of writing a sort of comedic documentary is to just trawl through all this stuff to find these little moments, these beautiful gems. I'm like a magpie, you know, I'm looking around for the shiny things. What are the shiny little moments? And it's interesting. Not, not everyone has that sort of skill, no. you know? And, and so I work with my wife. She's very good at it. She quite often knows what I want. Um, you know, and then you sit down and you broaden it. When we were filming, um, uh, Toronto's Checkered Past, TV show on the history of New Zealand, you know, and we were looking at constructing these sort of well-constructed episodes. We would sit there and I would run them live, virtually live in front of a test audience to see what worked and what didn't and, and what made sense and what didn't. And, and then someone sat down and said, yes, but what's the meta-narrative of this episode? And it's, we did, we laughed. And then we said, you know what? Actually, they're right. What is the overarching yep. narrative of yep. this episode? Yeah, you need a story arc. Yeah, you need to have a story arc. And, you know, these little questions. So, I mean, I could, you know, I, I could literally do um, a 19-hour show on the history of Antarctica just from what we've discovered up to this point. But you've got to narrow it down to what, what do you choose for those 50 minutes? So why did you choose Antarctica for a live show to tour around New Zealand? A serendipitous sort of... Um, Invitation to go on a boat with Gareth Morgan um, about nine years ago. He ran a, a trip down to Antarctica. He got on, you know, oceanographers and geographers and whale experts and climatologists and various other kind of folk and uh, ordinary people. And I was invited. I don't even know how my name came up. Um, maybe because I'd done off the radar and radar's patch various programs around sustainability to kind of shoot the doco um, version of all these people heading down. Um, that was sort of, so we got a cheap passage uh, in order to, to do this. And, I mean, who turns down a month on a ship to go to Antarctica? You know, kind people, of uh, people who want a month on a ship going to oh, Bahamas? The, yeah, well, exactly. The food was good. And, and the fact that they, they're trapped on a ship with, you know, people had to give lectures. Um, and so we were with people who had served, I assume, you know, they'd done 20 seasons on the, on the, the geologic drill rigs down there. We were with oceanographers. None of them had been down by ship. And mm. so here's this, here's this incredible journey you know I, i've been so privileged in my career all i wanted to do was basically just make docos you know and i never thought that i would ever get to do it and suddenly you know i was looking back at it the other day during this sort of the covid period going what have i actually done with my life um i wrote it all down because it's easy to forget you know so suddenly i'm on this this trip um with people who would their experience of Antarctica, even having spent, you know, literally years of their life down there, they would put on their clothes and cry shoots and they would get on this plane and then they're down there, you know, but to go by ship and to witness their joy. You mm. know, a guy who's in his 60s, who's an oceanographer, who knows everything there is to know about the circumpolar current and, and to be with them as they're watching the light change and the sea conditions and to see the first iceberg, you know, these are magical kind of moments. And so I'd, mis I'd stupidly said they were having an ice festival. I said, I'll do a, con I'll do a we'll write a show of the comedic history of Antarctica. Um, and then I started reading it and it was generally unrelentingly grim. And so you have to find the humour in it. You have to find moments of, of, of ridiculousness and joy. I've certainly seen some quite comedic skits about Captain Oates' exit from the tent. You know, uh, there was something, again, that serendipity. I was looking up, I was trying to sum up the story. What is the show about at the start? You want to tell people what the show's about when they've come in so they've got some understanding of what they're about to endure. 
it's like it's like an Antarctic trip sit down and endure this me talking at you for 50 minutes um and uh there was a, a, a the words hummock and bummock and so the hummock is the top of the iceberg the little bit that pokes out the bummock is that great mass of the iceberg that no one ever sees and so antarcticana is the bummock show what are all the little glistening bits in the bummock that people don't really know about and oats is a classic if there is any hummock story of Antarctic history, it's the story of Lawrence Oates leaving the tent, leaving Scott and crawling out into the snow to die. It's become part of the mythology of, of English and human exploration, noble self-sacrifice in this vainglorious kind of cause. What a lot of people don't know about that is, is the nature of who was Oates, this guy. That, and most people, they might not even know the story, but they'll, they'll know the phrase, I'm just popping outside and maybe some time. <laughs> Whether or not he actually said that, you know, Scott was such a beautiful writer. His diaries, right up to them, literally as everyone died to the moment of his death, are beautifully written. Yeah. Stunning pieces of, of, of sort of documentary writing in the moment. Um, so whether Oates said that or not, we don't know. But Oates, here he is. He was a, an English gentleman. Uh, he did his English gentleman do. You, you signed up to the military because there wasn't much else to do if you love your hounds and your horses. And off he went to the Boer War. He was a, should have, by many accounts, received the Victoria Cross for this moment when he was surrounded by the Boer and they called upon him to, to surrender. And he said, nope, I'm, you know, I'm not going to surrender to you. So they kept shooting at him, shot him in the leg and nope, still didn't surrender. And eventually um, he sort of rescued from that situation. Um, as I say, the, so the story goes, the English officers didn't want him to receive a Victoria Cross because it would reflect badly upon the fact that it allowed him and his men to get into this position in the first place. And you know, what is, once you've done that, what is there to do, you know? So he's one of 4,000 men who apply to go to Antarctica with Scott. They can go through the bloody CVs of that. You know, likes Oates. Um, and Oates' relationship with Scott. Oates knew horses. He thought Scott was a, a moron. The guy he said to buy the horses um, that Scott thought would be a good idea will take ponies. You know, the Norwegians took dogs. Um, the horses were described as a croc. Oates smuggled onto this ship where every single thing was meticulously recorded. He smuggled extra feed on for the horses. How do you even do that? You know, and then suddenly there he is um, in, in incredible pain as his, his legs below the knees are, are literally frozen blocks of ice. He, he's taking a couple of hours each day just to, the, 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 the agony of pulling the boots on those frostbitten feet and he knows that he can't go on. And he knows he did, that had a discussion, you know, as you do over those long winter months as they prepared to go down and head for the pole as to and Oates, had, Oates had advocated pistols on every Antarctic expedition, every journey out, because he said, if someone is, if something happens to you, you can't risk the lives of you just know that's it. You know, you can't go on. And he considered the pistol to be a noble way out. Um, Scott didn't want pistols for various reasons. Um, and he'd taken morphine and, and, and opium was the out. Uh, Oates didn't want that. Um, and so that had conversations. And, 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 and Scott's diary, it's, it's traumatising to read. You know, he says, Oates, the poor, the poor man basically begged us to know what to do. This conversation had been going on for many, many days. And they said, oh, you'll be okay, you know, pull on. But they knew. Mm. And so that morning, what happened in the tent? The morning, Oates, you know, unlashed the, the frozen lashings of that little canvas tent and, and crawled out into the snow. If people know that. They don't know is because it was so painful for his, for his, you know, his boots to be put on. Crawls out in his socks. And the day he crawls out is also the day of his birthday. You know, you start to put all these little things together and suddenly this, this story that people think they know, mm. there's so much more richness to it. That's what I love about telling history stories. You know, you can just... The problem is, Kevin, what do you leave out? You know, I could do a whole show on Oates. I could do a whole show on the moment in that tent and what led up to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. with, with um, you know, the, the other two who were there at the time. Um, so there's Scott and there's, there's um, Bowers uh, and, and the Doctor, um, you know, their story as well. You, God, you know. So what's the best thing you left out of Antarctica? Oh, that's a very good question. Probably some of the details around around oats um oh, probably actually some of the armiston details you know again you know armiston and his men put weight on on the way back from the pole um and, and armiston was criticized because he was ruthless he knew exactly how many dogs they would have and exactly how much weight those dogs could pull and there's there's a place called is it called um 
blood camp or something like that where, where he went no on this day it's in my list we killed 21 dogs and they killed the armistice didn't he sat in his tent you know um did, probably i could do a whole show about the dog i could have put more in about the dogs you know i think hillary actually when hillary was down there um and we you got to put the hillary story in because you know again most people know that hillary climbed mount everest i, I think it's it's great but i don't really like stairs even um so for me hillary's great moments that antarctica story because it's quintessentially new zealand it's it's a man tasked with you know he had to go and lay out these supply depots so that um Fuchs's trans-Antarctic expedition could cross over past the pole and pick up all these supplies. And, they, and I would love to, I think it's one of the great moments in New Zealand history where people go, if you could go to any moment, when would it be? I'd love to go to the moment when, when Hillary and his men have laid out that last supply depot, you know, and they look south and they look at each other and they think, oh shit, they give the Massey Ferguson a bit of a rattle. We've all done it with a boat tractor, you know, and you have a little listen and you think, oh, I reckon there's enough, I reckon there's enough fuel. Should we, should we have a bit of a crack? And then, you know, sending the message off, you know, all the way to London to say, let's say, you know, um, crevasses and God willing, we're pushing for the pole and having the English go, you can't do that. <laughs> it's ours. It's ours. <laughs> they thought it was theirs because, you know, the other side of that is, is that very few people knew. Hillary was the third land-based expedition to get to the pole. Armistead was first um, a couple of weeks later. Scott was there and then nobody until Hillary and his bloody Hillary and Derek and Ed and Pete I think, and someone, you know, the farm turned up on their bloody Massey Ferguson tractors, towing a caravan. Um, the Americans were there. They'd flown in. Yeah. You know, so what did I leave out? God, there's probably so much. I, 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 and one day I keep threatening, you know, either with Antarctica or, or eating the dog of doing, you know, because people like binge watching things now, of doing the long version of the show, of right. putting in everything that tickles my fancy. Bring a plate. Let's do a seven hour version or an eight hour version of one of these shows and just put everything in. Even then, I don't have to do stuff. I'd like to see more on a month. The Norwegians never get enough credit for what yeah, they do. What, a, what an incredible guy who decided as a child that, that he would become an Antarctic explorer based upon reading the story, the Antarctic explorer, you know, based upon the stories that he'd read of some of his Norwegian heroes. So he'd slept with the window open, preparing himself. He wasn't even supposed to go to the bloody South Pole. You know, it wasn't, he, he had this expedition prepared. He was off to become the first guy to the North Pole. You know, um, he had all the sponsors and the suppliers oh, and the he boat. Trump, didn't he? he did. He got trumped by a former shipmate. Like he'd been, Armisen had been to Antarctica. He was one of the first to, to winter over on the on the Belgic Coast. He returned white over that winter. He knew the horrors of Antarctica and of being trapped in the ice. Um, but he was racing, and one of his shipmates had claimed to be the first to the North Pole, which turned out probably not to be true. Um, and so he thinks, "Show us what do we do?" So without really telling anyone. He ships off, and when he's out to sea, he says, men, we're not going to the North Pole. We're heading to the South Pole. He sends this famous telegram to, 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 to Scott, beg, you to, beg to inform you, Fram heading Antarctica. You know, the English, again, the English, they are furious about this. This Suddenly, there's a race. But, you know, again, what did I leave out? Probably the a lot about the kind of tension of that moment. How very dear this professional explorer you know, Scott was just a rank amateur, really. Um, bloody Armisen practiced. He went and lived with the Inuit. He practiced, you know, he knew which furs to wear. He knew what dogs were better. He knew how ruthless you had to be. What did I leave out? Actually, that's a good question. The English relationship with dogs. Yep. They had stronger laws for pre protecting animals than they did protecting children. <laughs> Scott couldn't bear to, to, to be as ruthless as you needed to be with the dogs. With the dogs, you know, you, the dogs are food for dogs. You know, and those dogs, you know, I tell the Mawson story, you know, that's the, one of the great Australian stories. I leave out some of the details of just how sick Mawson and Mertz become when, when they're trapped um, on, on Mawson's incredible journey. Uh, right. You know, which again, most New Zealanders don't know anything about. You know, Mawson is, you know, is, is Australia's Hillary. You know. He turned down a chance to go with Scott to the pole because he went, no, I'm going to go and explore this vast... Uh, this wilderness and, and claim some more of it for Australia because if there's something Australia needed more of, <laughs> it was a vast, bloody useless wilderness. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, like I can bore people for hours with what I left out. <laughs> okay, well, luckily we've got some more time, but not until we have a break. You've used
juice. Yeah. Shall, I, shall I get your water? No, I'm good. I don't want to, to overhydrate, then I have to go to the toilet. Okay. Right, we're back. Um, so, talking to Teredo about his about his live shows, and uh, I think we've done Antarctica. Uh, so now, what I'd like to do is talk to you about eating the dog. Uh, your quintessentially Kiwi yeah, show celebration of our all those kind of near do wells and, and, and people who sort of live by that, that great New Zealand saying she'll be right when, you know, when more often than not, she's not, not right, you know, uh, who gave it a go. It's a show that, um, gosh, it's, 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 it's been almost a sort of a, a life's work in many ways. It started with, with, I guess I suppose it sort of started with not knowing anything about New Zealand history that I worked with Mike King on a show, Welcome to King Country, which was about some aspects of New Zealand history. And then through various other things, um, uh, Naitahu got in touch with me. They wanted to be a part of the Christchurch Arts Festival, but they didn't want to be the Māori part of things. They wanted shows that were an integral part of the whole kind of festival. And so they decided they wanted to have shows based upon, or, 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 or work based on, on Pepeha. So they had this kind of hui, they brought all these incredible artists together uh, and me. Um, I put in a, an application essentially to write a kind of a Bill Bryson-esque history of the South Island based on various pepiha uh, to sort of relate these stories to place. Um, and then it just, it grew from there. Some of the stories that came from that original He Tordy show, I think actually many of those stories are still in Eating the Dog, you know, to this day. So it grew from that kind of hour long show to the, the kind of rambling two hours with a break that it is today. So what's the best part of it? Telling the stories. You know, you, need, you know, people, I've, I've performed the show hundreds of times. Um, you know, uh, I never tire of telling those stories. I never, I, I, I've, it's not so much telling, it's sharing the stories. I never tire of sharing those stories because they are such good stories. There are stories in there that make me cry every time I tell them. The story of Charles Lorraine, the first aeronautical death in the country. Um, a balloonist uh, down in Christchurch who was going to jump from a balloon 20 odd thousand feet and entertain the people of Christchurch because that's what you did in 1899. Uh, didn't work out all that well. Um, she'll be right. No, no, should have got a bloody emergency escape valve, but they cost, they cost money. And he was a New Zealander. Um, so, you know, the, the joy of sharing those stories and then the, the, the constant joy of finding new stories and just putting them away in this kind of ever increasing pile of stories that should be told in the future. So when you do a show like In the Dog, does it change from night to night? Initially, it does because I'm not particularly good at writing a script. Um, I try to structure it and I try to write the things in. And, and really, you're, you're finding it on your feet. There's a very different thing between the written word and, and then how stories flow live and in the moment. Yeah. Um, some Actually, some of the couple of the, the quite shameless to say, some of the best lines in Eating the Dog came from heckles in the crowd. Someone yelled something out and you went, that's, a, that's the better line. And so I've always been an improvisational kind of comedian. So I will, I will just, I will fill my brain with all of this knowledge and I'll write out a structure and I'll put the PowerPoint slides in that will give me a sense of where I'm going. And then the first, you know, various sort of versions are very much, even though you kind of know what you want, they're improvised a little bit as you figure out what parts of the story work better. Yeah. The pace of the show, the timing of the show, where bits go, how, is this, I, I often try to structure things within a larger overarching story. Does that work? Does it yeah. make sense? So, yeah, th the nature of it changes. And then once it sort of beds down into its final form, yeah, it does change every night because it's a live yeah. event. It changes by the nature of the people who are there. Um, their reaction to it, it changes by the nature of the venue that you're in. Small room, big room. Um, you know, I, I remember there was one night in Waikaia, a beautiful little town on the bottom of the South Island. I was doing a fundraiser for their... They had a great big bottle made out of bottles that they were building. Don't you love New Zealand? <laughs> Part of their museum. Um, and then every kind of 10 minutes or so, it was a Sunday night and I, I was staying with some people that I'd met once or before and the snow was coming in. So I knew I was going to be marooned in this little town. But every 10 minutes, this old bloke would... Uh, uh, and he'd get up from the front row and he'd walk over to the little heating machine and he'd drop a five or a 10 cent coin and click, and the heaters would continue. And I said afterwards, I said, why didn't you just put a whole lot in? It's like, oh no, you do that, the heaters don't work. You know, <laughs> so yeah, there is all of this, you know, that's the joy of the live medium. It's not, it's not TV. It changes. And, and that's, that's what I love about it. 
because you never know what's going to happen. I've I've done it where it does. I've told it a hundred times, and I suddenly get to the end and go, I don't know the punchline to this story, <laughs> or I've left a bit out, and then yeah. I have to fill that in. So yeah, that's the that's the beauty of the live performance. But how much of that is also the fact that you're doing these shows in small towns because you're not taking them to big cities, are you? No, no. Uh, you know, I've done. I've done them in Auckland at Sky City and I've done a couple of seasons down at Downstage. You know, that was pretty amazing to see your name, you know, sold out tonight, Downstage. I think I actually had the record for the for the best bar takings, you know. Well, you'd make me drink. Well, but here's yeah. the thing. No one was coming to it and getting drunk. Um, and there was a lot of boomers. I'm, I'm, I'm big with, with the sort of uh, an older generation and a young, a very young generation. But it just seemed to be that people wanted to have a drink and, and hear these kind of stories. But yeah, I'm out in little places that I didn't even know existed. When I first started touring, eating the dog, I was um, invited to places. I would look on Google Maps and, and they just literally weren't even there. So I think Ponga, Ponga How, Ponga Roa or somewhere like that. Like I Googled it and it was like, there was, it didn't even come up. The road just sort of petered out. And you went, is this a real place? Am I being kidnapped? But there's a there's a joy to it, and, and the reason I'm going to places like this is because I just basically put a call out to people to say, "Hey, does anyone want this fundraising show?" Because I'm quite a lazy person; I don't want to go through all the effort of organising a tour. I've done that with other things. It's a, there's a lot of hard work. You've got to find venues, you've got to sell tickets. You know, you've got to have a, a way of getting into communities who yeah. may not see a poster up at a cafe because they don't leave the farm mm -hmm. for 27 days. Um, so I kind of outsource the difficult part of it to, to community groups. Um, and so you just never know who's going to email you. And there's a real gamble. Like, are they going to be a bit useless? Generally not. Generally, they're really great. And they have their own networks. And so you'll find yourself in these tiny little halls in the middle of somewhere, you know, with a community who have come in. And you're, I'm making really good money. They're making great money. Um, and the joy of it is, uh, you know, I remember being in... in, in Reparoa, and and they were going, oh, this is great, this little scout fundraiser for Reparoa, and, and you know, they had people coming from Rotorua and Taupo to Reparoa mm. on a Saturday night to spend money on a show, because I wasn't doing those places. So for a community group, this is great. Then you've got your auctions uh, at halftime, I've auctioned all kinds of things, uh, alpacas, um, I auctioned a tack of our, I auctioned a vasectomy, um, the woman, not the, for an alpaca, though. not for an alpaca, no, for, a, for what appeared to be an increasingly sort of ashen faced man who was standing next to this woman who was vigorously bidding. Uh, the fact <laughs> that, that I say vigorously bidding implied <laughs> correctly that there were other people bidding for this vasectomy. I don't know if it was a local vet or who was doing it, but it was, you know, and that's part of the joy as well. That's part of that live experience. You've got your options and, and then, you know, um, there's a generally uh, a lot of these places, they'll have a, you know, your ticket price will include supper. I love that. So come along. And pe it's, often people will bring plates, and one place in particular, there were three different kinds of custard square, and and so it's a it's a it's a fascinating way of touring because it's not as if you are backstage and then you're on stage and then you perform and then you're off stage. Yep. You you arrive in the afternoon, you pack your gear in. Just me. They're often looking around, going, "Where's your crew?" It's just, it's just like me and my car, and I, I had all my gear stripped down to what fitted in the car: yeah. sound system, projector, screen. You'd arrive, lug it all in, painfully set it all up, ask if the electric fence could be turned off um, because it was on the same fuse, and there was a clicking, uh, making sure that the that the the pie warmer's not on the same fuse as the sound system because you know they're going to turn the pie warmer on an hour before the show, and the fuse is going to blow. All of these beautiful little things, and then you sit backstage. Doo -doo -doo, Try to figure out how you're going to know the right time to do the show is. Come on, do the show. Half time. You're out having a bloody cup of tea in a custard square with people. Now, and for a lot of performers, you know, I, I'm thinking predominantly, you know, the ones I've had experience with in the stand up world, that's a, that is a very strange experience for mm. people because you like to be, it's, but you've got to worry about that. If you've got to be out with people, the show is a bit crap. You know, <laughs> you want to make sure it's good. And then afterwards, you pack down and have a beer and go and get on your way. It's a joy. No, no, I can understand that. And, and small towns have their own defining characteristics, don't yes, they? Yes, they do. And, and you can often tell the kind of, the, not the viability, you can tell the sense of a town by how many people can, they can get along to these events, how much community support is, is there for these particular groups, how, how vibrant is the town feeling in terms of coming out. And, and you know, I'm often out in the provinces anyway. I'm, I, I don't, I, I do a lot of work in the city in terms of a lot of corporates, uh, you know, but, but comedy wise, I don't sell as much in the city as I do in the, in the provinces. Um, and I do a lot of work out in the provinces. I'm a rural kind of guy. 
you know, so I'm, you know, I performed in, in wool sheds and all kinds of things. You know? So I kind of understand where they're coming from. And part of the reason that I got into doing stand up uh, or, or, or performing was because I would drive past some of these venues, the little forgotten war memorial hall on the side of a road. And I think, oh, I want to perform there. Who would come? And so the fact that I've managed to find a way of doing it, yeah. that makes money for me, that makes money for communities, that allows me to showcase my, um, my or, or bring the joy of these stories to people. Because it's their history. It's New Zealand's history. You know, taking it right into the places that it happened. But it's also incredibly important. I mean, I, I, I grew up in a small town on the Waitaki River and, and, and I lived right next to the Memorial Hall and, uh, and two of my abiding memories are John Hoare doing a show there and Selwyn Too Good bringing... What's in the bag? It's in the bag, yeah. It's in the bag. You know, and, and, and the, yeah. there was a chance for little you, in Waitaki, middle of nowhere, to see live entertainment. Yeah. You know, and I remember as a kid, I, I remember the BNZ debates. My father took me as a, as a fifth or sixth former, I think, to one of the BNZ debates. Hop, the, the, you know, Hopkins and Tom Scott and McCormick and um, uh, who else was there? Uh, probably A.K. Grant. And these were... This was just a, a life-changing experience. I had never seen anything like this. The humour was definitely not pitched at a, a young high school Gary student. McCormick. Yeah, you know, um, one of them, God, some of, I still remember some of the descriptions. One of Tom Scott or someone had described one of the other debaters as having some kind of um, uh, venereal illness that uh, <laughs> I won't go into, it, but like I still remember. But you know what I mean? If we're in the cities, we have the privilege of going seeing, you know, live entertainment. When you're in the provinces, you know, stuff just doesn't come. How do you expose people out there, kids with all of that talent, to say, "Hey, you can, you can do this. You can mm. be on stage if you're a musician. You can look, you know, you can, you can play instruments." I think one of the the best things that will happen because of the COVID thing is it's, it's both it's good and bad, but the ability for people around New Zealand to be exposed to their own artists because you can't tour overseas. So where do you tour? You tour all the little provincial places and because there's nothing else, people can't go away and go and see something because the big acts aren't coming. Hopefully they will go out and they'll see our acts, which will bring them as much joy, more joy possibly, yep. than going and seeing some of these big name overseas bloody scenarios. Dinner tonight, turkey, here it is. I've got to pluck it. Uh, to be honest, I've never really plucked anything before, and so I'm not entirely sure where to start. Can't imagine, however, it'll be that difficult. I've lost my knife. I think my knife's in the turkey. No, oh, it is too. My knife is in the turkey. Generally, when I'm driving, I don't have to think to myself, my goodness, this car is worth one and a half million dollars. Driven by someone who really doesn't know what he's doing. So that's your gear there. Yep. So you yeah. nice and, you know, really good. I've never completed a PlayStation course successfully. OK. Is that the wrong time to tell you that? Uh, really? It's the New Zealand tour by Memorial Hall to Memorial Hall, yeah. by Dairy Factory to Dairy Factory, by War Memorial to War yeah. Memorial. You know, and I, I re even the very nature of those War Memorial Halls, there's something incredibly powerful about them. When you go and see those names, particularly you get to some of those small places and, and the list of the same surnames, you think brothers, cousins, yeah. you know, the places weren't big. Um, and you dig even further back into it, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like a little mole of, uh, you know, history and stories i want to find out more and i remember i was asked to do an architecture conference and i just assumed they wanted me to tell us here's my normal old bloody history stories of the taranaki highway man and the burgess gang and charles lorraine and they said oh no no you're the opening keynote of this quite significant architectural conference we want your re reaction to the architecture of new zealand I, thought, oh, shit, well, I live in a house um it was an ex-state house so i know a bit about that and i did do third form tech drawing uh so I, I really looked at it through the, the buildings that are iconic to me. You know, we've got a, a thousand years of history. We don't have the, the Acropolis. Acropolis? You know. Acropolis. That's the one. And the, and the Acropolis was, was, was a slightly <laughs> shoddier version. It didn't really last. It fell yeah, down. It was with Asterix. Yeah, the Acropolis. <laughs> um, that's a great, I loved a bit of Asterix. You know, we, all the cathedrals that were built, you know, a thousand years ago uh, or 2,000 years ago, and that started falling apart a thousand years ago. You know, for 800 years, the buildings that were built 
have largely disappeared because they were made of organic material. So what do we have architectural why you know you, you've got the dairy factories that speak so much of that kind of the, the rise of farming and the, and the cooperatives um, the wool sheds I was in one the other day performing um, for a drought relief thing the particular wool shed I think was 1873 that it was built it's still there and you can and what I love about those you see the names going back on the stenciled up in dark parts of the building you know so and so sure here in, in, in 1879 and then 1953 and and right through to last year, the history. And they weren't only used for the sharing of sheep. These were the big buildings. So a lot of your functions happened there. You, you, weddings, funerals, political gatherings, rallying, rallying of the community for whatever kind of crises or disaster had befallen them. Yeah. So these buildings have a, have a history. And then even the very nature of the state house, when you start to dig down into why these state houses were built, why do they look like they do? You know, with the Labour government coming in and saying, "Here is the here is the the thing," and you start to read, you know, the the houses were designed by the you know various Labour MPs and their wives. You can imagine that today. You know, the bloody Minister of Building gets a husband, and a, oh well, with it we'll do this, and we'll pepper pot them there. And you look at Savage Crescent down there, and in, in um, uh, uh, Palmerston North. You know, I even got to do a history of the Manor too. What are the best shows I think I've ever done, done once. And, and someone said, can you do a history of the Manawatu? And I said, I probably can. It's a, a big section on brutalist architecture. Some of my favourite <laughs> brutalist architecture, the most brutal of the brutalist architecture, right there in the bloody town square. Yep. And if you have a look at that building, it is gorgeous. And you get to go back through the archives. But it was said of that building, it was it was what the architects designed, but that the council could afford. If you when cannot sum up New Zealand architecture in one line... When it was built, Brian Elwood was the mayor and it was widely called Elwood's Erection. Look, it is stunning. And when you look at some of those, it, it, it's hard to see now because the, the foliage is great, but you look at some of those early photographs and it is a stunning piece of concrete. I love it. It's one of my favourite buildings. The joy of finding out this kind of thing is that you can then share it to people and say, you know, if you start talking about brutalist architecture and the history of this building in Palmerston North, everybody in Palmerston North has been past that building. Mm. Very few of them will understand why it is like it is and what part of the global architectural you know canon it fits into that's the beauty of it i love it you know and so as i say you know the, the i think i was talking about war memorial halls fiona yeah. jack did this incredible exhibition on that i talked about um at this architectural conference she went back and she went to the archives and found all the original um applications for funding to build these halls because after world war one the memorials that they funded were memorials they were stone edifices or, or, or archways with the names of, of locals, they were decorative. Um, yeah. World War II, very much more practical. It's how do we rebuild all of this? So they wanted things that would last, halls or sporting things, fixed, you know, something you could use, a tangible product that the community could continue to use if they were going to invest this this very precious money that the government was, was, was doling out. Yeah. And some of them, there's a couple in particular where it literally looks like some farmer has got a ruler and a ballpoint pen and drawn the shape of a hall quite roughly and someone has written the name of the hall, you know, the Mahanui Memorial Hall on the top. But then if you go and look at that hall and look at this ballpoint pen drawing, they are literally, they match. They, that's what they built, this rough kind of drawing that looked like a child had drawn. You know, and, 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 and bless and be, Fiona Jack, for going out and, and bringing all of this into one place and allowing us to kind of experience this little bit of social history that changes the very way that I now look at every more war memorial hall building in the country. Yeah. You know, when I have the privilege of going into some of these buildings. You know, and it's it's great. I, I remember being in Takapau, and the place was packed to the gunnels. And you know, someone afterwards saying, "You know what? This was. Uh, thank you for coming here because we have not had this many people in our hall for for twenty years." You know, I think the fire department went overly happy. But you know what I mean? There's a joy as a performer in a being able to perform and b being able to perform something that you love, the telling of these stories, and then the joy of taking them back to people who don't get a lot of entertainment yeah. in, in the provinces and then having them come together and experience their joy of being in a room. It, you know, works on a lot of, I quite often cry, I'm an easy crier, you know, and sometimes you're up there and you, and, you, and you put all of that together and you think, you know, I'm still doing that thing that I always kind of wanted to do 25 years later in yeah. a way that I hadn't expected. Yeah. And the, and the great thing about it is with, with telling history stories, you don't even have to make anything up. It's all there. You just got to find, find it. And then you have to find the bit that's interesting. And then you have to find the bit that's interesting to you as a storyteller because you've got to tell that story then 200 times. Yeah.
yeah yeah so what are the next stories you're going to take on to the, it'll be it'll be the new zealand wars i've for 20 odd years i wanted to do and i don't know what to call it a commemoration a celebration a commemoration of the new zealand wars i grew up 10k south of rangariri you know one of the the most important social and historical sites in the history of the country and i knew nothing about it i lived you know i can see the waikato river from my parents farm i knew nothing about the great invasion of the waikato the fact that the british had built a state-of-the-art warship to take the waikato over in sydney and sell it and nothing of that you know and so i, I want to somehow take those stories and i'm i'm not a i'm not the definitive historian of any of these i'm a gateway drug I'm, I'm, I'm the gateway person in who people can come and see some of these shows and hopefully they will then go on and, and, and find them deeper. I'm a thin, a thin bit at the top to get people inspired to think, wow, I didn't know that happened. I want to go and find out more. And so it's all yeah. going to be based. I've always wanted to base it on Te Tokawaru's letter to the British, um, the greatest 236 odd words written in the history of the country where, you know, he says, do not, come here for i have eaten the flesh of man my throat is constantly open to the, the flesh of man and my women and children have eaten the british's beef you know essentially why why did he write this letter why did this educated um young guy you know who, who traveled around he you know he was very well schooled through the the missionary schools he'd been a man of peace he'd had the year of the lamb and now it's the year of the lion why did what prompted this what changed this in, in terms of the, ge the geopolitical sense, what happens when you are, are down here and you are facing the pointy end of the largest empire well, pretty much in history up until that point who was coming down and you're the last place that, you know, that conquered the world. What happens? Yeah. Why, you know, and, and, and what do you do in that situation that can causes you to, to bring together all the various strands of global history up to that point, your own, your own religious history to bring some of that back the, the, and to fuse it into this, into this document. Yeah. Yeah. Including turning passive to the world. Yeah. And then, and then to go back on after that and, and to come back into that kind of that, that world of peace and, and conciliation and, and negotiation, you know, um, and as they say, various people argue, you know, perhaps the greatest military mind in the history of the country. I mean, you certainly, up in the, in the top few and why don't we talk more about these people we celebrate all the overseas stories and celebrate our own stories and once you start to celebrate the stories of place suddenly that that place is, has a has a has a deeper significance to you because you yeah. because stories are part of landscape again it goes all the way back to that original concept of 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 heat already of, of placing the landscape and stories into landscape and landscape into stories yeah so, you know it's, it's the same journey with humor. That's going to be the interesting thing, the balance of, of the humor and not, because these are, these are very real and very raw and very powerful stories that are still being attempted to be kind of constructed and understood yeah. to this day. You know, there will be descendants of people who, who, who on both sides who played a part in these stories. You know, there's a conversation to be had as well around who can tell stories. What versions of stories do you tell? Yeah. Who do you cast yeah. in, in certain lights? It's a, it's a complicated piece of work, you know, but, uh, you know, now that we're having history taught in schools, that's, that's great for that generation. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's shameful in this country that Jacinda Ardern had to say last year, I think it was, it's a millennial moment that we're going to be teaching our history in schools. You know, it's, but what happens to people who, who are beyond school, who don't have access to yeah. this? Who, who, you know, I often think that we're, we're stuck at the treaty. The treaty is this thing that people, that's what they think history is. And, oh, there's all this bloody, no, actually, it's, it, that's a moment in history. It's yeah. deeply significant on a number of levels, you know, um, and then all the things, but, but all this other stuff happened around it that plays into the context and the, the ramifications and the repercussions and the, you know, and as I say, you don't have to make it up. It's all there. You've just got to figure out what part of it you tell. So there you go. To yeah. add us, you have the Land Wars coming to a wool shed or a memorial hall yep. near you. Marae or a classroom or a, you know, wherever, wherever people gather. It's the oldest human thing after we figured out that fire burnt us and we could light it in a cave. The sharing of stories, the telling of stories. In a, in a, in a real world context, I don't think that will ever change. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So that was Tereda.
Yeah, that's people, our latest I vision. Say, if, people, if people have any stories, please do get in touch because, you know, if we don't share these stories and if you don't say, did you know about this? So many of the stuff, stories I've got, someone said, did you know this? Oh, I didn't know that. I'm going to go and find out more. So do do share these stories with yourselves or, 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 with, or, with, or with you through your website. Sure. Through WOMAD. Don't know how to get hold yeah. of me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to uh, Creative New Zealand and thanks to WOMAD for, for deciding that in this age where apparently we couldn't get together and share stories, we'd have to do so digitally and apart. Um, and, uh, and somehow we managed to delay long enough that <laughs> that, that didn't matter anymore. And uh, thanks to you very much for tuning in and for watching hopefully more of these uh, stories on World of Words Goes Digital. Bye. Bye-bye. And shit, we recorded. Now who knew? These conversations are proudly presented by WOMAD New Zealand with the support of Creative New Zealand. That I actually watched myself hurl the magazine across the room and I thought to myself, people only do that sort of thing in books. Mm -hmm.